Johnny? Davey. It's great having you back. They wrote us that you'd been hurt, but they didn't tell us that you were. You can say it, John. Blind. I didn't want you to know until I got used to the idea myself. It's all right now, Mother. It'll hardly change things at all. With my pal Smitty here, I'll get along just fine. Sure. Sure you will. Mom, where's Dad? He's in town. Well, let's get him. Let's get him right away, and Dick, this calls for a family celebration. Good old Landis get together. Come on. A celebration for my blind brother. Hardly changes things at all, he says. Hardly at all. Never see the sun come up again. The things growing in the fields or the faces of his folks. Dad, always so proud of David, the gentle son, the studious one, the teacher. And Mom, hiding the pain, pretending like the rest of us. And my brother Dick, the solid businessman of the family. Joey, my youngster. Grace, my wife. For us, that's why he went. Remember what he said the night he left. To me, this war isn't about something big and confused and somewhere far off, Johnny. I'm in it just so families like ours can keep right on being families like ours. Here's your train. So long, Johnny. Take care of yourself, soldier.
Don't you think you should, John? What's that? I, I wasn't listening. The minister wants David to come to church tomorrow and talk to the congregation. Well, I don't think I'd be very interested. Now you're just being modest. They want to hear everything about the boys out there, David. What they do and how they live and what we can do to help more. I'll think about it, but I'm not making any promises. Uncle David, remember Poochie? Your pup? Sure, Joseph. Oh, she ain't a pup anymore. She just had puppies of her own. Six of them. If you come out in the barn, I want to give you one. Joseph, don't bother Uncle David. He'll weigh you out if you give him half a chance. I'd like to have a pup. That is, if Smitty here approves. Oh, he will. They look awfully cute. Wait until you see them. I mean, well, they feel awfully cute. <laughs> You men go in the other room while we clear off. Wait a minute. I've got something to say. Something that concerns all of us. I'm enlisting in the Marines. John. You can't mean it, John. My mind's made up. I've got to. You'll have to get someone else to help with the farm. Well, you know we can't do that, son. Good hands are mighty hard to hire these days. Besides, you're the farm. You're what makes it work. Your father spent his whole life trying to make something of this place. Now we've got something to show for it. All those hard years. They'll be wasted if you leave now. I can't stay any longer. Think this thing through, John. We all know that Uncle Sam needs men in uniform, and women, too. But let's let him decide where he needs us most. Some of us must go, from factories and farms alike. It isn't that I have to go, it's that I want to go. Everybody can't fight. But food's important, too. Your place is right here on this farm until Uncle Sam tells you otherwise. That's the way it's been all my life. It's always been me that was left behind. Well, this time I'm going. Nothing anyone can say can stop me. Now don't fly off the handle. Be reasonable. Be reasonable. You can talk. You gave up your business to work in a war plant. You're doing your part and you're happy. But how do you think I feel? Every time I go into town, Mr. Jackson tells me about his three sons that are in the Navy. He looks me over. Joey, what can I say to him? All his friends' dads are in uniform, but his own ain't. He's ashamed. Oh, John. It's true, Gracie, and he's right. Most of all, David, this afternoon, the moment I saw him, I knew then I had to go. You're all against me now, but you've got to understand, every time I saw David for the rest of my life, I'd hate myself for taking what I thought was the easy way out. I'm sorry, Davy. I, I didn't know that you were... John wants to join up. I had a feeling you would. Is Daddy going to be a soldier, Mom? Is he? I bet you they make him an officer, a lieutenant, a major, or maybe even a sergeant. <laughs> when we built this farm, there was nothing here but a lot of stones and stumps. So I guess I'm not so old, I can't keep it alive. Sure you can, Sam. <laughs> what do we want to go fooling ourselves for, Mary? Without John, this old place would just wither away and die. I was born in this room. Gonna miss it. Gonna miss Grace and Joey. Miss them all. But I've gotta go. Why can't they understand? Aren't you going to say anything? No woman wants to see her husband go. But I'd never want you to stay, John, if you didn't think it was right. Church. 
speech, John. Yeah, Uncle David's gonna make a speech and tell us how he shut down the gaps and everything. I'd like to hear it, son, but I'm gonna get away by Monday. I've gotta get things in shape. Ah, oh, gee, Dad, I wish you'd go and tell everybody about you gonna be a Marine. You take care of that for me. Are you too hurry? Don't keep waiting. I should go. It'd be my last chance. Most of us have known David Landis all his life. When he rose to distinction as a professor at our State College of Agriculture, we took the pride of old neighbors and friends in his success. He was among the first to go to war. He has given much to us and to his country. Now he is back planning to teach again. We, his old friends, know that he will teach again. David, we welcome you home. I shall be honored that you will speak in my place this morning. Yesterday, when I was asked to speak to you, I wondered what I could say that would be of interest. Many of you might expect exciting stories of the battlefront. I know that's what my young nephew Joseph hopes to hear. Then last evening in my old home, I came face to face with a problem that is close to every one of you. You, the farmers of America, have been asked to produce more than ever before. Short-handed as you are, you wonder sometimes if you can do it. Others among you are troubled with graver doubts. Is the job you are doing as important as another job you might do in a war plant or in uniform? My brother John has been asking himself the same question. Last evening, he told us he'd made up his mind. He wants to put on this uniform that I must now take off. He wants to fight with a gun in his hands. I felt for him. I think I understood. Not alone his position, but that of all others who, too, have been asking the question, is this the biggest job I can do? I wasn't sure then that John's answer was the right one. I couldn't sleep. I went down into the sitting room of the silent farmhouse. I stood before the old fireplace in that room I had known so well as a boy and as a young man. Yes, the pheasant I had shot so long ago, my first pheasant was still there. And grandfather's old gun. And the deer dad had brought down after I had missed. I sat in my father's old chair. What problems had been pondered there over the years? I touched the chairs my father had made for each of us when we were born. Felt the names he had carved on them with our birth dates. 
slowly I began to realize that this old house was more than just a house, that our old farm was more than just a farm. Here was typified a way of life, the roots of which are basic to America's security both in peace and in war. The farm itself gave me the answer to John's question, where do I belong in this great world crisis? It began the day John was born. It's a boy. A boy. A boy. It's, uh, not that. Not that. Well, I, I was all ready for a boy, Doc. Look, see, all I had to do was carve in the name was an H. John, eh? Uh -huh. But, uh, but suppose it'd been a girl. Well, I was ready for a girl, too. See, all I had to do was put in a name. <laughs> John will grow. Ooh. Someday he'll plow two acres to my every one. John's not going to be a farmer. Oh, of course he is, Mary. The soil's in his blood. It's deep inside all of us. That day, John's name went into the family Bible, just below mine. Before many years, we began to learn what it meant to be a farmer's son. It seemed as if we were always carrying water and wood. We used to dream small boy dreams of inventing some way of making a fire without wood. Every morning we had to drive the cows to pasture. Every evening we had to bring them home. There were many lessons to be learned that we would never forget. One, which animals are man's best friends and which are not. gave John a cat. Excuse me, please. Certainly, dear. Hey, John. Did you know we have a new calf out in the barn? Can I go out and sit? Can I? Well, now, hold on. It's time that you learn the responsibility of owning something all by yourself. Now, if I gave him to you, would you take care of him? See that he was always fed and watered? You mean it won't be mine? My very own? Of course, Johnny. Oh, boy. <laughs> John was the proudest boy in the county. To him, that calf was the most wonderful possession in the world. He took good care of it. But the year was 1917. Our country was at war. And, as now, every man had to do his part. My brother Richard went to France. John did his bit, too. He gave his calf. Food was needed then, too. Richard came back from war, but not to the farm. He married and went into business in town. When I was 19, a family sorrow brought a time of decision to John.
went for him hours ago. to be a teacher. He wants to go to agricultural college so he can teach the other farmers how to make the best of what they have. And John wants to go to college too. They've earned their chance. Well, I can't run the farm alone. One of them must stay. I think John is the younger ought to. Never mind that. I haven't got half the brains of David. I think he ought to go. He'd make a great teacher. John gave me my chance. He stayed on the farm. It was four years before I came back in the midst of the Depression. I had my degree, but I needed several more years to get my professorship. As John drove me home from the station, I began to see changes all along the way. An iron bridge over the creek. If it had only been there the night John went to the doctor. A paved road replacing the old rutted dirt one. A party line connecting my father's farm with the whole world. The old farm looked good. Hello, Daddy Mother. Ready. Isn't that cake done yet? <laughs> what have you been doing? You look ten years younger. Oh, why not? With all the newfangled gadgets John's put in, I don't have half the work to do. Come in, Mother. Well, what do you know? Water right here in the house. More than we know how to use. Here's where we get the power. Furnished free by the wind. Don't you see something there besides the windmill, John? You bet I do. I see a million steps saved between the well and the kitchen and the spring in the barn. Come along, son. I want to show you John's pride and joy. He calls it his treasure house. Well, there they are. <laughs> Just like I pictured. You know, I did a little dreaming myself when I worked out my summers away from home. <laughs> Sometimes I could read between the lines of John's letter. <laughs> I, I don't suppose you ever thought of it, but this three-man plow helped you get your education. Three-man? Mm -hmm. Dad calls it that because it does three men's work. Like the parlor that runs that windmill. 
far as full of men like that. You can't see them any more than you can see the wind, but they hurt just the same. You must have worked awfully hard to get these things. Yeah, well, we had to. But it was mighty worthwhile. In just two more years, you'll be a professor. Dad, I've been meaning to talk to you about that. Yeah, what? What do you mean? I'm not going back. What? You've been showing me all the good things about the farm and trying to tell me how well you've been doing, but I know better. Richard wrote me about the money you had to borrow. We're in a depression. Things are bad and they're going to get worse. Yes, but that's no reason for you to give up. No, John, you've given me four years and I know what it cost you. I can't go on taking. Things are bad and I'm going to stay here and help. Oh, we won't let you do that. No, sir. Not after all these years in school. I should say not. Sure, things are tough. Who would like them? You're going back to college and get that PhD, just like you always planned. But how, John? How? We use our heads. This isn't the time to go backwards. This is the time to go forward. See all that equipment? Well, we're going to get a lot of it. We're going to bring this old farm right up to date. Sure, we've borrowed money. We'll borrow more. We'll make this farm produce and pay. John wasn't just talking. I went back to the university and got my professorship because he and father did what they said they would do. Dynamite cleared the stony field. Dynamite drained the boggy field, adding acres of rich, productive land to our farm. For years, father had worked behind a team, driving himself as hard as the horses. He'd lived to ride a tractor. And then, electric power. The picture changed. No more boiling soap in a soap kettle. No more sitting up nights over homemade dresses. Industry and science made it easier and cheaper for mother to buy her needs in the town store. Mother has never been 50 miles from home, but she has heard a king speak to her from London. Enjoys the same fine music and entertainment that only city people knew previously. Now John was married, and laboratory and factory brought better living to my father's house. Better utensils, better floor coverings, better plastics and paints to make the house cheerful and easy to clean. Many of these products were made by chemistry from cotton, wood, milk, and vegetable oils produced on the farms themselves. Yes, science had teamed up with the farm. I had a hand in this myself. I brought home many new ideas and methods from the agricultural college, and John put them to use. taking a gamble out of farming. I'll say. A lot of gambling went when we started planting hybrid seed. That's so, but disinfecting the seed like this gives us just that much more insurance. We're getting 20 bushels better yield an acre than we used to, and ours ain't what's called top cornland. <laughs> Your old grandpa will think you're a couple of magicians if you can see the old farm now. The land was growing old and worn out. Better fertilizers were needed to put back its fertility. Industrial scientists perfected them, made them available in quantities. They produced urea, with nitrogen taken chemically from the air we breathe, making America independent of foreign markets for this vital plant food. You saw like improvements take place on your own farm. They represented years of experiment, patient research, and investment of capital. When war seemed inevitable, again our country called for an all-out production. John and the farm were ready. For a man who didn't want to stay on the farm, my brother John did a magnificent job. But he didn't do it alone. He had the help of hundreds of men and women. For an army of specialists is at every farmer's command. Agronomists, specialists in field crops, analyzing soils, fertilization, crop rotation, draining. Horticulturists working for the farmer, improving the yields of orchard and garden, planting, checking, constantly striving for sturdier, better varieties. Entomologists and plant pathologists working for the farmer, saving huge sums annually by studying destructive insects and plant diseases and finding the means to control them with the help of chemicals from American chemical companies. Chemists perfected a hormone compound that keeps fruit on the trees until harvested, checks losses, brings higher market prices. Chemists created from American materials that are always available, even in war times, and an abundant supply of vitamin D for poultry, assuring vitamin-rich poultry feeds that help grow larger and healthier chickens that lay more eggs. 
Agricultural and mechanical engineers, market economists, veterinarians, the thinkers, explorers, experimenters in public service and in industry, all are working with and for the farm. And even with darkness, John's work and the work of other modern farmers is not finished. He keeps in contact with the newest in agriculture, brought to farmers in millions of words printed annually, adding to their education, helping to improve their stock and yield. Last night, as I sat in my father's chair, I realized how far the farmer has come in only a few generations. And I heard the answer to give to my brother. Once, three out of four Americans were farmers. Today, one in four is a farmer. The three men released from the land, built our cities, wrote our books, established our schools. In 1800, it took 60 hours of man labor to grow 20 bushels of wheat. Now, it takes four. In 1800, it took 35 hours of man labor to grow and harvest 40 bushels of corn. Now it takes eight. The unseen helper in the roaring engines of his machines, his allies of science and industry, and his own steady progress, have made the American farmer the greatest food producer per man on the face of the earth. There is your answer. In your farms, in your cells. You asked me here to tell you about soldiers, fighting, sweating, dying. I know those men are thinking of other soldiers, the farmers. We're thanking them every day for another kind of fighting. I can tell you that wherever they are, our soldiers are the best fed men in any army. And they are counting on you to keep them so, now and when they come home with victory in their hands. They know you will. They know that the American farmer is on the march, 10 million men, a thousand million acres strong. This is the farmer's answer to Pearl Harbor, and Bataan, and Corregidor, to the rape of Europe, and to American ships torpedoed in the icy waters of the Atlantic. Yours has always been a proud calling. You have always had to fight. And when the question comes, what did you do? Every farmer can hold his head proudly erect and answer, I worked my fields, though hands were few, though hours were long, I worked my fields. And not one American soldier fell for lack of food I could have raised. I gave the man behind the gun, and in the cities, the man who made the guns. I gave more cattle from the great Southwest, more sheep from the range country, more hogs from the prairie states, in the greatest food mobilization in all history. I gave more corn and wheat, more cotton, more vegetables, more fruit, tobacco, more rice, poultry, more of everything to keep our country strong, to make our cause victorious. Yes, the farmer is on the march. No medals, no citations, but everyone a soldier manning his weapon. The truck farm. They say foods needed as much as bullets. Well, maybe a couple of extra bushels of these will help us get back to peaceful living again. And the quicker, the better. The dairy farm. My husband's grandmother raised 10 children, but she found time to help clear this farm and take a man's place in the field. I guess if I can do this job, I'm going to make a try at it anyway. The farm boy. They tell me I'm too young to fight. Yeah? Well, I'm fighting anyways. After school, I mean this old tractor or helping to feed a company of United States infantry. I've got a brother in that company, and I guess it's up to me not to let him and his buddies down. The farmer is on the march, and at his side march his services of supply. The scientists, the teachers, the chemists. Industry and enterprise producing for the farmer better implements, better fertilizers, better insecticides and fungicides. Better materials of all kinds for better farms and greater outputs everywhere in America. To you who might ask, shall I stay on the farm? Is my job important? I say look upon your farm for the answer to your questions. You will see victory and peace and the full maturity of a rich new age of which this is only the dawn. 
We, the soldiers of America, fighting for you abroad, salute you, the farmers of America, fighting for us at home. You are the soldiers of the soil. Thank you, David. You made me see. I hoped you'd come. I'm glad you did. My job is here. Glory, glory. 